So let's begin um, by talking about this kid uh, and how this kid uh, became this grown-up uh, who is obsessed with money. Um, it starts for me in middle school, a uh, private school in Chicago uh, called Francis Parker. Is Parker in the house? Are there Parker people here? Almost every place I've been, somebody's turned up, but not today. Um, so uh, Parker is a uh, progressive private school uh, in Chicago. Uh, there were only a handful uh, of schools, private schools in the city at the time when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. Uh, incredible place. Uh, I'd started there in kindergarten. I was a lifer. Uh, when I was in middle school, my parents split up. Uh, if any of you have been through divorce, you know that turning one household into two uh, can be a difficult situation financially. Uh, there is often a decline in the standard of living, particularly in New York, when you need to get two apartments instead of one. Um, <coughs> so that happened in sixth grade and seventh grade. One of my parents lost their jobs. And it was 10 or 15 years until my family was back economically to where it had been before. Um, the school uh, rallied round. Uh, my brother, my sister, and I were sort of seamlessly um, uh, brought into the financial aid system at the school. Uh, it was incredible the way uh, they treated us. Um, there was never any question that the Lieber kids were going to leave Parker, and that was all great. Uh, but four years later, I had to apply to college. Um, we didn't know very many people who had navigated the financial aid system before. Uh, thankfully, somebody slipped my mother the name of the guy. And this was before everybody had like seven consultants and tutors on speed dial. But this guy, it turned out, when we called the number and found him, he was an assistant dean of financial aid at Northwestern University in Evanston. And he told us to come see him. And here's what was going on up in his office at Northwestern. Just about every day at 5.01 p.m., after all of his colleagues had left for the day, he would sort of slip somebody in the side door. He would close his office door behind him and lock it. He would drop some money on his desk. It was about $100 for an hour of his time. And then he would proceed to tell you all of the secrets of the financial aid system. <laughs> How to fill out the FAFSA. Which money should be in which accounts. None of it was illegal. There were and are tons of legal loopholes in the financial aid system, both in terms of the federal application and in terms of the separate applications that the schools offer up. So, you know, he wasn't breaking any rules and he wouldn't talk to people who were applying to Northwestern. So, um, I I'm not sure the school knew what he was up to. Uh, I'm still not sure they know uh, that I'm out talking about him at this point, but um, in any event, uh, you know, he was incredibly helpful. I got uh, an, an insanely generous package of financial aid from Amherst College, um, and you know, that lasted for four years. I managed to get out of college with just under $10,000 in student loan debt, which was a little more than average at, at, average at the time, um, but was not at all burdensome. So I learned two things from that experience, which turned out to be uh, extremely helpful <coughs> and impactful later on. I learned that the world is full of incredibly complex systems uh, involving money and that they are made to be hacked. <laughs> Legally. And second of all, I learned from that experience <clears throat> merely by the fact that my mother had brought me along for it in the first place. So I was a senior in high school. She never doubted for a moment that I belonged in that room, that I ought to see the numbers, uh, that this impacted my future uh, more than anyone's. And so of course, I was gonna be there, I was gonna have a front row seat, I was going to be expected to ask questions, uh, that I was gonna be an equal partner in the process. I didn't think much of it at the time, but flash forward 10 or 15 years and it's 2002. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is starting their personal journal section, the consumer news section of the paper. I got hired to be part of the launch team. And what those editors said to me there, what they saw in me that I had never seen in myself before, they said, Ron, what you don't understand is that your beat at this newspaper is going to be the beat that you've had all along in life, and you've just never realized it. Your beat here at the Wall Street Journal is going to be beating the system. Whatever the system is, that's going to be your job. And so I was the person who became uh, the guy who wrote about how to return all of your wedding gifts for cash. <laughs> 
You can imagine how happy Gordon Siegel was at Crate and Barrel when I called him to tell him that I was going to reveal all of this on the front page of the journal. Um, I, some of you may have noticed, uh, if you've lived here long enough, you know that every five to ten years some Yahoo tries to start a, um, a helicopter service from the heliport to JFK. It's happening again now. The last time some idiot tried this was, I hope the owner of the service isn't in this room. <laughs> Um, the last time somebody tried this, uh, you know, I had a hunch that it was actually going to be faster to take the subway. Because uh, what they don't tell you, but what all of you know, is that it takes like 37 minutes to catch a cab and cross town, and then you've got to wait in the TSA line, and then it turns out the helicopter dumps you at Terminal 8, but if you've got to go to Terminal 2, it's, you know, 26 minutes to get across the airport. So yeah, we did this story about how it's, it's faster to take the subway. We tested it, and the subway person got there first. So, you know, I became this person, right, the beat the system person. And when they said that to me, a window opened up in my mind and a memory, too, of having been in that office at Northwestern, figuring out basically how to be an unprofitable customer. <laughs> and so that was what I grew up to be. Uh, and it wasn't long uh, until the journal started a Saturday paper, uh, and they realized that what I was doing was also personal finance. Uh, you know, different from investing, but it hit you in the wallet. It was important. It was essential. Readers liked it. They gave me a column in the Saturday newspaper. Before long, the Times noticed what I was doing. They hired me, to, me away to be, the, to be the personal finance columnist for the paper. I thought I had it figured out. I was on top of the world, and then I became a parent. And nothing blows up your worldview, as most of you in this room know. Uh, more than becoming a parent. And within a couple years, I mean literally just two or three, uh, our daughter was asking us really complex questions about money, about whether we were rich, about the people who had more than us and the people who had less than us, and why in our third floor apartment in Park Slope, why we did not have a basement of our own that was filled with toys the way that her cousin's was in New Jersey. And even though I played Dr. Money in the newspaper every Saturday for the Times, and I have since 2008, I was tongue-tied, literally frozen solid by her questions. I couldn't quite figure out why, and I tried to analyze it. Right On one hand, these are money questions. Money invokes anxiety and feelings. It reminds us of bad behavior in our past or present. Um, so, you know, that was complicated. The parenting questions themselves always seem high stakes, right, because these kids are our flesh and blood, or we've taken them in and made them our own. We want to imprint them with all of our best qualities and none of our bad ones. Uh, so when she hit me with these things, I realized that they were actually deep, because what she was getting to were questions that we had made, or decisions we had made, big choices about our life. Um, these were consequential, they were important, uh, and I did not know what to say. So I did what I normally do now when I don't know what to say or I don't have the answer to the question, and I asked the internet. And I started doing blog posts on the New York Times website with some of these questions, my attempt at kind of half-baked answers. Uh, commenters would sort of pour in and we would work the answers over together and we came up with some pretty good scripts. Some other parents, parents like you, um, started to notice and right around the time that Occupy Wall Street began, I got some calls from parents uh, throughout the tri-state area. And they said, Ron, we've got a real problem here in our community all of a sudden. Uh, the people with more the people with more than average, are feeling demonized. The schools are saying to them, you need to tone it down. Uh, the birthday parties uh, need to get less lavish. Um, you really shouldn't take 10 kids away on spring break with you anymore, or if you do, they shouldn't come back and talk about it at school. Uh, don't let them take taxis, uh, definitely not car services. Uh, leave the you know, iPhones and other electronica at home. Just tone it down. Uh, and that did not feel very good to those parents. Uh, they felt like they were having to apologize, not just for what they had, but who they were. And the people with less, they didn't like it either, because they felt like their noses were being rubbed in everybody else's affluence at a time when a lot of people were really hurting. And they especially didn't understand the questions that were coming home uh, from their kids, and they did not appreciate them. The questions like, uh, how come uh, you did not decide to be uh, an investment banker <laughs> or an entrepreneur and instead decided to be a teacher or a social worker or a journalist, God forbid, because if you had decided to be an investment banker, then we could have a second home like my friend. 
So the parents were annoyed by this. And the school, uh, present company accepted perhaps, the schools were useless because to the extent that they had diversity curriculums at all, they were all about race and they had nothing to say about social class. Which makes perfect sense because if you're in an affluent public school uh, or if you're in a private school, chances are the 30, 40, 70% of your parent body are in the 1% or in the 2%. Uh, it's elite, if not elitist. It's a difficult thing to reckon with. Makes me uncomfortable just saying it, but it's true. And so they weren't talking about it, not at all. So they came to me and they said, Ron, you seem to be working all this stuff out in the newspaper. Why don't you come and speak to all of our parents and set everybody straight? <laughs> so I said yes right away. It felt like a fundamentally new challenge. And I tried to figure out what all these parents had in common, the people with more, the people, that, uh, people with less. I asked myself a question. I said, okay, well, how would all these different parents answer the same question similarly. And I asked myself, well, all right, what's the single worst word that somebody could use to describe my child in theory uh, that would be the worst indictment of my own parenting, right? The single worst word that would be an indictment of my own parenting. The first thing that popped in my head was spoiled. And I think I thought of that word because it's a passive verb, right? It's not just an adjective. Uh, spoiled by whom? Spoiled by you, by all of you, by us, by their parents, right? Because spoiled kids aren't born, they're made. And so I heard words like mean, and I heard words like racist, um, you know, definitely things that we don't want our kids to be, but spoiled was the one that I heard most often. People had a visceral reaction to it, uh, except when I asked my mother. I asked her, single worst word somebody might use to describe us kids that would make you feel the worst about your parenting. She looked at me with great alarm and she said, average. <laughs> this is what you find under Jewish mother and Wikipedia. <laughs> but the vast majority of other people said spoiled. And so I tried to think about that. All right, if that's what we're trying to solve for, then what's the opposite of spoiled? And I made this list of values and virtues and character traits, all of the things that add up to the kinds of grounded, decent kids we all want to shove out into the world one day. And I thought about things like um, modesty and uh, thrift and prudence and uh, curiosity and generosity uh, and <coughs> perseverance and grit and perspective and patience. And I looked at that list and I thought, whoa, you can use money to teach every single one of these things. So rather than assume that when our kids ask these questions that leave us tongue-tied about money, that answering them, and answering them in a transparent, age-appropriate age way would be impolite or impolitic or, or somehow inappropriate, what if we did the inverse? What if we embraced every single one of those questions and resolved to answer them honestly and openly? What if we honored their curiosity? What if we decided that those questions were going to lead us on years-long conversations, journeys, to rituals even around spending and saving and giving as a family in a way that could teach them all of that stuff? What if we did that instead? And so, what the opposite of spoiled is more than anything else is a solemn promise to our children. It's a generational manifesto that says we will be better at this than our parents were. When our kids ask us these questions, we will answer them. We'll be transparent in an age-appropriate way. We will honor their curiosity and we will do it because we know that it's kids' job to be Curious, first and foremost, right? Their job is to figure out how the world works. And money, money is a source of great power. But it's also a source of mystery, right? Because grown-ups don't talk about it very much, uh, and often they're trying to you know, hide things about it. So kids get very confused, and of course they have questions. It's only natural. In fact, again, it is their job. So let me give you one 
tool that will be helpful uh, when your kids ask you these questions. Uh, to me, the single best response uh, to any question about money is actually another question. You sort of look back at them and smile and say, oh, why do you ask? And it's not an accusation, right? Why do you ask? It's meant to convey the fact that we think it's great that they're curious, that we're glad they had the courage, that we welcome it, but we really want to know what it is that's behind the question. Because often with the younger ones in particular, the question is not actually the question. Um, because the younger kids, you know, even if they have the math skills to go to four figures or five figures or six figures or seven figures or beyond, they don't have the context. They don't really know enough about how much things cost and how the world works yet to make sense of the value of your apartment or your net worth or your salary. They just, you know, the number's not going to mean anything to them. Um, but even more often, they're asking uh, the big cosmic questions. Are we rich or are we poor? They're asking those things because they've overheard something, maybe uh, two parents fighting, uh, or maybe a single parent on the phone with a financial advisor or a creditor, or um, they've read the newspaper. I mean, God help us once they start reading. The questions I get about the stuff on the subway uh, and the ads um, are, are, you know, sort of blow my mind, right? Um, but what they're really asking, often in those cases, is some version of questions like this. Are we okay? Right? Are, are we normal or are we different from everybody else somehow? And that's really what they're getting at. Um, why do you ask? It's also helpful in other situations too. Uh, I often think uh, about my friend Christy, uh, lives in Greenwich Village, uh, has lived there for 20 years, uh, originally from the South. Uh, her father comes to visit uh, not very often because he thinks New York is sort of the uh, world capital of all evil. Um, he's sitting there in their living room uh, one day with Christy, his daughter, uh, and his grandson, Gus, age seven or so, walks into the room and he looks at them and he sizes himself up, sizes them up and pulls himself up to his full height. He says to them, when are we going to start having some more sex around here? <laughs> so <laughs> Christy, as far as she could recall, had never actually talked about sex with her own father before. Now he was her live audience uh, as Gus, you know, uh, demanded sex from his mother <laughs> and his grandfather. She didn't know what to say, so she gives a sort of, you know, abbreviated version of the birds and the bees and Gus kind of scrunches his face up because um, it turns out he didn't want sex at all, right? He didn't want it with his mother, not with his grandfather, he, he, there the wasn't it. It turns out she found out only days later that he had stolen a couple of stray minutes in front of a Family Guy episode. And what he realized there, right, was that if you um, say the word sex enough times in the right way, the laugh track just totally explodes. <laughs> so if she'd only thought to ask, she could have figured this out. So why do you ask? It's a really good tool for any and all money questions. It's also a great stalling tactic, too.